The PNY 1000 is... It's essentially the first breathalyzer for COVID-19. Users simply blow into the straw for roughly 10 seconds. The results can take less than three minutes. The way the test works is it actually looks for compounds that are released from, um, from the breath. The U.S. FDA recently authorized it, saying it identified over 91% of COVID-positive breath samples and almost every negative case. Not as accurate as a PCR test, but better than a rapid antigen test. The U.S. company behind it hopes to use it at big events, restaurants and airports. It's really a movement to bringing tests closer to the patients, making them cheaper, making them more available. It hasn't been submitted to Health Canada for approval yet, but some doctors here are eager to see more testing options and a Canada-wide strategy for tracking this virus. It's very disjointed how people are using testing in the country. Testing sites have largely disappeared and rapid testing offers limited data. We also reduce our ability to understand what's going on in the community uh, when we decrease testing. I wouldn't say we're flying blind. We're looking to see what other sources of information can be used. That includes wastewater surveillance. The data shows whether virus levels are rising or falling, but can't track cases. Innovations like the breath test could help. A device can make a difference if it includes also a website where you report your result. In terms of testing and tracing, I think this is a fantastic. Shashanta Mitra is impressed with the breath test. He's leading a team working on a paper-based COVID-19 saliva test. Really easy to use environmental friendly. This is where you see a red line. While governments are responsible for strategies around tracking, Mitra says scientists are still working to improve testing. What we are trying to address here is the consciousness within our society to manage this COVID-19 in a more meaningful manner. We work with a negative sample. And ultimately, the goal is to help everyone make decisions that can save lives. Christine Birak, CBC News, Waterloo, Ontario. So testing is one thing, but Christine raises the question of tracking as well. On that, we heard from the head of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, who said, as many countries reduce testing, the WHO is receiving less and less information about transmission and sequencing. This makes us increasingly blind to patterns of transmission and evolution. So with testing and tracking down across the board globally, is Canada flying blind? Joining me now to talk about that, infectious diseases specialist, Dr. Susie Hoda. So Dr. Hoda, we, we know that testing has really dropped off a cliff. And, and you know, in some places we have things like wastewater surveillance instead. Is that enough? Is that sufficient? I think wastewater surveillance can be helpful, but it's not really sufficient. Um, first of all, it's done differently in different jurisdictions. So it makes it very hard to compare what's going on across different areas. And it's also not completely comprehensive. We're not doing surveillance on wastewater everywhere. So we lose some of the granularity of information that you have if you have a more wide scale sort of testing uh, approach. So those are a couple of the disadvantages of wastewater surveillance. But I think also it doesn't give you individual level information. So you can kind of track trends you don't really have the ability to translate that directly to prevalence yet, although maybe later we'll be able to do that. But also for people who have to make decisions about what to do in their own lives, we don't have that individual level uh, information. So I don't think wastewater surveillance can really replace all of the rest of the testing that we need, but it is certainly a useful tool. Right, and, and when you use that word trends, I mean, it makes me think, you know, thinking way back to the start of the pandemic, we had, you know, the original coronavirus, uh, we had Delta, Omicron posing different threats, each variant, you know, bringing a new wave of cases. Given the state of testing in this country, are we prepared for the next variant, whatever that might be? Well, we are continuing to do some variant testing and, you know, there is PCR testing or molecular testing that's happening through lab systems that allow us to do some surveillance of what's happening with variants that could emerge. But it is somewhat limited. And I think the bigger question is what's happening elsewhere because variants can arise from anywhere in the world. And so it's more of a global question as to whether we're prepared, um, you know, on a global level to deal with what could be uh, coming up. Um, 
Now, that's just the surveillance side of it. And having advance war warning from the testing is really, really helpful. But, you know, can our system actually respond to it? Are we prepared from that pr perspective? It's a whole other question. And, uh, you know, a lot of it comes down to how severe are the variants going to be that come up? Um, you know, how much effectiveness do we get from vaccines and things like that? Right. And hospital capacity, I know, is a big one. Uh, Dr. Hoda. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you.